या देवी सर्वभूतेशु मातृरूपेण संस्थिता नमस्त 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 नमो नम I bow to the Lord in all forms and also in yours. I would like to read to you from Conversations with Yogananda a passage. It's number 305 for those of you who have the book. A visitor who had read autobiography of a yogi, though he was not an SRF member, came to converse with the master. I took notes at their meeting. May I ask, out of curiosity, the visitor said, why, although you call this a church of all religions, you place so much emphasis on the Christian religion? Actually, the master replied, we place emphasis on two of the world's great religions, Christianity and Hinduism. We concentrate especially on the teachings, rather than on the religions, of Jesus Christ and of Krishna. I do so because that was the wish of Babaji. I, that he and Jesus Christ together sent this mission. They are the first in our line of gurus. The wish of them all was expressed to me by Babaji, particularly to interpret the Christian New Testament and the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, and thereby to demonstrate the essential oneness of the truths of both religions. His visitor, of course, had implied something more also. Why didn't the Master teach all religions? On other occasions, the Master answered this question also. Though perhaps on the occasion I've described it, he didn't feel inspired to go more deeply into the matter with this particular man. To complete his meaning, therefore, I should explain that he said also that his mission was to show the essence of all religions. It was never his purpose to compare various scriptural passages intellectually in order to show their similarity. In other words, he did not teach syncretism. That would have meant merely skimming the surface of truth. His mission and that of our line of gurus was to show the essential oneness of truth itself. It is at their deepest level that all religions are one. For this purpose it sufficed to show the, one, the oneness of only two of the great world religions. Outwardly, Hinduism and Christianity are very different. Yet both have produced saints of high spiritual attainment. To know God is the eternal need of mankind. All people need to understand their need for personal, direct communion with the Lord. Self-realization, the Master predicted, will someday be recognized as the essential truth of every religion in the world. His prediction referred not to his organization, Self-Realization Fellowship, except insofar as that organization promoted this ideal. What he was referring to was the eternal principle itself, Self-Realization. This principle is destined in the present Dwapara Yuga to become accepted everywhere. The true purpose of religion, regardless of its diverse dogmas and credos, is union with God, the eternal self, pervading the whole universe. Now this is a very important point to understand, because there's been a lot of talk in this past century about the oneness of religions and proving it by quoting from different ones. There was a movie put out by Lou Ayers, he was a person in Hollywood, who was trying to show that because, actually no, it was, it was uh, first of all, it was originated by John Ball, I think, and then Luares, it may have been one or the other, one took the idea from the other, but he showed that the, in all religions they teach that you should do unto others as you would like them to do unto you, therefore there's this unity. Well, that's a pretty superficial unity. How you behave is not what religion is all about. It's a part of what it's about. But the goal of religion is to help you to commune with God. The goal of religion is to help you to know who you really are. And too many religions, as opposed to the deeper teachings of their own masters, emphasize this outward aspect of how to behave, how to um, be kind to others, and so on. That's not enough. 
God created us out of his own consciousness, and the goal of life is that one realization to realize that he is our own self. We are that. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. We need to discover that we are not this ego. And as long as religion to you means just um, living in a, another body like this one for eternity, I cannot imagine a worse hell than living, being doomed to live for eternity in an ego. What to speak of a body? Having this one little consciousness that I am this when I could be everything. There's been so much ignorance preached in religion. This is what my guru came to the West to help people to understand, but it's needed in India too. There are a lot of people who don't understand this deeper aspect of union with God, of realization of the infinite self. This is what religion is really all about. And so you see that in religion, they're always thinking about, well, when you, when you have pleased God, it's sort of like the, I don't know if you've ever been to the Sistine Chapel in Rome, it's in the Vatican. Beautiful paintings by Michelangelo. But my God, the message. First of all, you've got on the, behind the high altar there, you've got God. It's called the, uh, the judgment. And on this day of judgment, God is condemning the poor sinners to hell. All the energy of the painting is his condemnation of those poor sinners. For heaven's sake, they're a part of him too. If he condemns them, he's got to condemn himself. Michelangelo put some man who was, uh, he considered his enemy put a, his fake face in the lowest hell. And this way he got even with that man. But you see God in this, in this painting, sort of like this with great anger. And the saved were just sort of, well, you take the salvation for granted. It doesn't mean anything. All the energy of religion is spent on condemning those poor sinners. And that's not just Christianity. It's all over. But my guru's mission was to show that that's not what religion is all about. Self-realization is what religion is really all about. They have, their purpose of these great masters has to, been to show you who you are. Jesus Christ didn't come into this world to show us what a great master he was. He came to show us what we can become. All those masters don't think that it's blasphemy to say that you can become like them because you have an absolute duty to become like them. They don't come here to show us how great they were. They come into this world to show us how great we can be and are potentially. We must understand that we are that. So the religion of the world is basically not being kind to other people and being truthful. Those are all uh, their aids to that. In Patanjali, he explains it's not the Eightfold Path of Patanjali. It's the Eightfold Path that is the universal path of all people to find God. He's not giving practices. He's giving stages of realization that in the beginning, there are the yamas and the yamas. You, you naturally, as you begin to understand that God is in all and that you are a part of God, you naturally become... It's just incumbent upon you. You can't harm other people. You can't be untruthful. You can't be unchaste. You have to be all these various outward qualities, not because they're a practice, but so, not so much as because that's who you find that you, this is a stage. Once you've reached that, then you're ready to become still. But the paths that he showed, it's not his path. It's in all religions, you will see, a bhakti, well, uh, Bhakta, I should say, will, in his deep devotion, reach the point where he no longer can act outwardly. Saint Teresa of Avila was a great devotee of God, but she said that there's a certain stage in prayer where the mind can no longer pray. And my guru, in his one of his prayers, he said, Oh, how maddening! I can pray no more with words, but only with wistful yearning of my soul. These are stages that we come to, whatever our religion. You will see, for instance, there was this wonderful Sufi Muslim mystic, Rabia. 
And she was at the, when she was an old woman, was lying on her deathbed and very ill. And three men, disciples, came to her, and one of them, trying to give her encouragement, said, well, nobody is a true lover of God who is not willing to suffer for God's sake. And she said, this smacks of egotism. Something more than this is needed. So the next man tried, well, he said, well, Mother, um, he is no true God who is a true lover of God who is not happy to suffer for God's sake. She said, more than this too is needed. They said, well, Mother, then you tell us, who is the true lover of God? She says, he is no true lover of God who does not forget his suffering in contemplation of the one beloved. You go beyond your body, your ego, all these things, it's universal. And if you look at the great sages, they all understand each other. It's the riffraff in religion that fight these things out and say, my way is right and all your ways are wrong. True devotees are all the same. Whether they speak of Ishwara or Allah or Jesus, it doesn't matter. The truth is the truth of your own being. You must reach the point where you realize who and what you are. Now this is what Yogananda came to the West to bring. I hope you don't think of me as being disrespectful when I call him Yogananda. If I say Yogananda Ji and 3, 308 and all these things, then I found that teaching in the West, they don't know what I'm talking about. So I simplify it for their sake. And here in India, I would like to make it clear that I could not have more devotion for him than I do. He was the greatest man I ever met. But more than that, in his greatness, he helped me to have faith in my potential greatness. And to me, that was more than anything the sign of his greatness. But he came not to show religions as religions. He wasn't interested in his own religion. Some of his own followers have been very rigidly or, that's the trouble in religion. They make our organization almost a, an idol. I said to one of them one time, when he spoke of self-realization as being the religion of the future, he cannot have meant self-realization fellowship incorporated. And this person answered, well, that's your opinion. How could it be anything on that level? How could it be anything but truth? How could anybody have another opinion? He taught that from the beginning. He used to say, this is not a sect. This is what happens in organizations. He said it again and again, this is not a sect. And one of his disciples said to me, well, I know he said that we aren't a sect, haha, but we are a sect. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't go along with that. And I do not go along with the institutional interpretation of his message. He talked principle. Principle is not organization. Principle, in this case, is self-realization. When we can understand that I am a part of that infinite one, when we can understand that he and I are one, when we can understand that my true self is not this body with this little ego, but that true self is in you, I bow to myself in you, and I bow to you at the beginning of this program. And one of the greatest inspirations I've had as a teacher has been the sudden realization that I'm teaching to myself. I'm sharing with myself. It's my own self that I see in other people. And their longings are my longings. And their doubts have been my doubts. And if I can share with them, it's to help them and to help certain things in my past that I needed to overcome and now that I have overcome, I want to help others to overcome in order to sort of nail down that faith that I have achieved. But it's all the self, don't you see? The most distant star is still your own self. The most far-off human being on the other side of the world or on another planet, who knows where, is still your own self. And all the sufferings and all the joys and all the hopes and disappointments that they go through you must go through. This is why the hope to find some kind of Eden on another planet, some kind of paradise where everything will be perfect, don't expect perfection. When I talk about starting communities, I never talk about 
about communities as something perfect. You can't create perfection in this world. It will not be perfect. The only perfection you'll ever find is when you know who you are in Him. So let that be your search. Who am I? Why am I here? These are the questions you need to ask of life. You are a part of the infinite. You are He. He is your true self and your ego is a merely deluded self. Your thought that you like ice cream and you like this and you hope to get that kind of job and you like this kind of trade and so on, that's not you. Know that within yourself you are He. Let me sing a song. I'll sing it to you. It's called God, God, God. And it's a song that Yogananda was given, my Guruji was given on the lecture platform in communion with the great Christian saint, St. Francis of Assisi. From the depths of slumber as I ascend, the spiral stairways of wakefulness, I will whisper, whisper, God, God, God. Thou art the food, and when I break my fast, of nightly separation from thee. I will taste thee and mentally say, God, God, God. No matter where I go, the spotlight of my mind will ever keep turning on thee. And in the battle din of activity, my silent war cry will be, God, God, God. When boisterous storms of trials shriek, and when worries howl at me, I will drown their noises, loudly chanting, God, God, God. When my mind weaves dreams, dreams, with threads of memories on that magic clock will I emboss God, God, God Every night in time of deepest sleep when my peace dreams and calls joy my joy comes singing evermore. God, God, God. In waking, eating, working, dreaming, sleeping, serving, meditating, chanting, divinely loving, my soul will constantly hum, unheard by any.